Hello everybody. A few years ago, I did a video on Nintendo's controls over the years. That was when the Switch was going into development. So I decided to do an update now that the Switch is out on the market. <clears throat> oh man, since I own it, so, you know, hence the reason this video is labeled number two. Um, and we're going to be focusing on the main controller that came bundled with the system, so we're not going to look at like the Pro Controller or anything like that. Um, and also, just some pros and cons of those controllers. And while we're on the subject of Nintendo's controllers, something I just thought I'd share with you, I came across this neat little, oops, neat little N64 keychain controller, controller keychain thing. Um, this was at Target for, I think it was like, I forget how much it was, but, <laughs> um, there's also a SNES one, two Wiimotes, and a Famicom, I guess they were focusing on the more, um, popular ones. But like I said, you can find them at Target. Um, they do kind of come in these type of things, although not this big. They're actually a lot smaller than this, but it's it's a trick to one of those things that, you know, like they, like, ha ha, you don't know which one you're getting. So the trick is to, because they have four holes in them, um, probably due to the Burger King Pokeball incident from back in the late 90s. But anyway, um, you can hold it up to the light and look through one of the holes and you can kind of get an idea of which one is in there. That's what I did, because that, the N64 one was the one I was looking for. But anyway, as for their controllers, let's just get started. So, first we have the NES controller. Now, rising from the ashes of the 1983 video game crash, this controller was a bit of a leap forward, because beforehand, controllers were basically just a joystick and a button, or numerical buttons and... Uh, dial type of things. I remember my grandmother used to have an original Atari 2600. Um, <clears throat> so this one had four buttons if you count the start and select. And it was perfect. It was really what all, um, worked well with a lot of these games. Like, for example, a platformer such as Wizards and Warriors, you had um, the B which would attack and A would jump. You know, and it was the same way with a lot of other platformers. And then for adventure type of games, like Zoda's Revenge, you would have the buttons for just special commands and such. Um, the only real negative thing about this controller is when it came to arcade ports. Case in point, the TMNT arcade game. The arcade machine had three buttons. Hmm. <laughs> you know, attack, jump, and special attack. Now, obviously, you need a button to pause the game, but not that you could pause in the arcade, but that's beside the point. So, the, what they did was, you ha in order to do a special attack, you have to push B and A simultaneously, like, tap them together. Another good example of this was the game NARC, which the arcade version of this, the arcade cabinet, had four buttons. Jump, duck, machine gun, and rockets. So, for the NES port, you, B is machine gun, A is duck, right, yeah, um, then you have to tap B to fire rockets, and tap A to jump, and if that sounds like a pain in the ass, that's because it is. Now, moving on to the SNES, my favorite console of all time, not just because it was the 90s, but it was, if you think about it, a lot of the games on the SNES, they've really, you know, stand out today, they still hold up really well. Maybe not all of them, but if you take like if you take all the bad, mediocre games out of the SNES library, there's still a huge ton of games that are, still hold up well. But anyway, this controller was another leap forward, if you will. It had eight buttons, if you count start and select. And, um, this made it perfect for arcade ports of fighters such as Killer Instinct to have six buttons. Now these, the A and B buttons to me, um, or the rounded over buttons, especially if you look at the European version where they're all rounded over in different colors, to me that always looked like the candy spree. Remember that? The spree candy, it was kind of like Skittles, but bigger, and you had to suck on them. Um, and then the X and Y buttons, which are dented, if you will, like the buttons on the NES, uh, look like sweet uh, Smarties. And the start and select buttons look like Tic Tacs. Uh, scratch that one. But yeah, this was a probably one of the best controllers Nintendo's ever made, I think. Just because it 
it really serves the purpose for most SNES games. Like, it's really all you needed. Um, the only real flaw with it, I think, is the fact that, like the console itself, it can turn yellow over time. And I guess the reason for that was something to do with the type of plastic they use, and it happens if it's exposed to bright lights or something. <laughs> Maybe there's gremlins inside of it. Uh, now we're going to move on to the N64 controller. Now, this was a very interesting controller, because, well, for one thing, I thought it was awesome how the large variety of colors it came in, and of course you could hold it in various different ways to play different games. And uh, one other thing that was really cool was the back port thing on the um, slot. If I can get the memory card out. Oh, there we go. Um, you could also plug in the Rumble Pack, which I believe came bundled with Star Fox 64. And there was also the Game Boy adapter thing that allowed you to play Pokemon games on the Pokemon Stadium, or use your Pokemon from those games in Pokemon Stadium. Um, and there was actually a feature, if you remember the game Perfect Dark, because this is something that tends to be kind of overlooked, I believe. Um, the game Perfect Dark, the first-person shooter where you could in order to make characters for the multiplayer in that, you would use the head and body of characters from the game. However, if you remember the Game Boy camera, which, you know, it was before the DS and stuff, you know, you could take pictures of your face and doodle on it and stuff. There was actually a printer you get to print them out, but anyway. There was going to be a feature in Perfect Dark that allowed you to take the Game Boy camera and put it into the adapter thing and plug it into the controller, and you, would, you were going to be able to take a picture of your face and use it for multiplayer in Perfect Dark. But they ended up scrapping that idea because, well, people would have taken a picture of their ass or something. <laughs> Although that would have been a pretty funny prank to play on your friends. Oh, here comes Jerry! What the fuck?! <laughs> now, despite these cool little things, this controller had some major flaws. For starters, um, it has directional buttons, or more specifically, the C buttons. Now, this created problems for games like Turok, the Turok games, because the way it worked was you could either, there was two ways to play it. Use the analog stick to move and the C buttons to look and turn, or vice versa. Now, when you do it, if you're using the analog stick to move, you have to, say you push C right, he'll turn slightly to the right, or if you look, you push C up, he looks slightly up if you're trying to get a headshot or something. It's very tricky, so the other way to do it was you use the C buttons to move, so it's like, you know, strafe left, strafe right, strafe forward, or whatever, and then the analog stick would turn and aim. It worked a lot better, but it makes it hard to go back and play these games because of the controls this way, probably because we've become so accustomed to using two analog sticks. Um, and the other thing was the the analog stick was very... It's a very sensitive device. See, games like Pokemon Stadium and the Mario Party games where there were many games where you had to cycle the analog stick or snap it back and forth and eventually that could break the analog stick. <laughs> and... This was also featured in Mario 64, a launch title for the system, where you had to cycle the thing back and forth. So it's... You notice that these are all first-party titles? Hmm. It's almost as if Nintendo did that deliberately to get you more control... buy more controllers. Hmm. Anyway. Moving up to the GameCube. This was another controller that I think really holds up really well. It's... Like, it's another one that's, like, perfect for what you really need. And... It really, it has, like, such a nice feel to it. I think, that, you know, personally, I think this is the best controller Nintendo's ever made. It just has, like, the perfect fit in your hands. Like, it just feels right, if that makes sense. And uh, just the design is really cool, too. Um, the C buttons were replaced by the C stick, which is somewhat better as, you know, because you have used that as, like, a second analog stick. It's okay. It's not great, but... It's better than using the C buttons. Um, they also moved the Z button up to the top, which I thought it was pretty interesting, since systems like the PS2 and Xbox had um, four buttons on top. Um, the only time that really caused a problem for me was uh, when I was playing uh, 
Time Splitter suits are perfect, which is also on the Xbox and PS2. I think this series, which I highly recommend checking out, it's like a sci-fi first-person shooter series, but it's very goofy as well. Um, very underrated series, in my opinion, but I, I believe this originated on the PS2, and um, like most first-person shooters, you push the right button or trigger to fire the, the gun, and it was the two left buttons on the top would, to my knowledge, in the other versions, would one would zoom and one would fire throw grenades, because I haven't played these games in a while, but um, in this version, Z throws the grenades, so you have to kind of hop your button, ba your finger back and forth, which feels a bit odd, but other than that, this, like I said, I think is the best controller Nintendo's ever made. Uh, moving on, excuse me, I'm just going to get a drink of water real quick. Sorry. Now we're going to start to get into the more gimmicky stuff. So we have the Wiimote and the Nunchuck, which, oof. <laughs> now this thing, it was sold off of the fact that it was the whole motion control thing. I mean, it was innovative at the time. A lot of people, lo well... A lot, some people liked it, you know. Most people who bought it just played it for, like, a week or so, and then they just stuck it in the closet or something. They didn't... Like, I, I've said this in other videos, most people just didn't know it was a game console, other than, like, gamers, so to speak. But, um... This was a controller that really... I don't know. <laughs> the thing, um... The whole motion controls thing, it's like... I feel like... You really have to be in the mood to play them, like motion control games. They can be fun, but you really have to be in the mood, like I said. Um, you know, for games like Mario Party and Wii Sports, it was fine. And one good example was, you know, there's a lot of shovelware-type games on here. There's one that's, like, kind of like Mario Party, but with pirates. Um, not a lot of mini-games, though, because I think they focus more on, like, accessories and such. Um, it's a pretty fun game, though. Uh, you know, and that was the thing. Some of the games on this... You know, you had to play like this, or, which, it feels weird, like, rather than just doing this, or like this, you're now like this, <laughs> you know? Um, but there were some games that you could play it just like this, it was like a, kind of like a NES type controller, and that was okay, and others that, I don't know, which, um, a lot of point and click games were just so, so weird. Um, because there were some games where it just really forced the motion controls onto you, like... A perfectly good example of this is, um... This game, Blastworks, where you can... Um... This was a pretty neat game, because it's, um... I definitely would call it a hidden gem, I guess, because... The way it works is... It's a side-scrolling shooter, where you can actually create your own vehicle, and even your own enemies. And you can play it with the... The... I forget what that controller was called, the... But it's like, it plugs into the Wiimote, it works like a SNES controller with two analog sticks, or you can play it like this. Um, so, you know, it plays really well, but the problem is, in order to create vehicles and stuff, you gotta use motion controls. Like, so, um, let me put it this way. Did you ever do, like, a puzzle-type game or something, or, like, the kind of game where you're, like, putting blocks together and stuff? Did you ever play a game like that on a computer? You know, it's easy to do with a mouse or a stylus or something. But imagine doing that with motion controls. Yeah. <laughs> but the Wii was successful due to the fact that it was... Well, like I said, it, just the um, audience that it was marketed towards. I mean, it's an okay system. Um, some games, like I said, you could play like this. Some were backwards compatible with the GameCube controller. Fortunately, Smash Brothers was one of them. Ugh. <sighs> Now we're going to move on to the Wii U. Now, to me, this is a very underrated system, but I'm not going to talk into go into details about why it failed, because I've done that in plenty of other videos. But, um, it's a very bulky controller. It's, I always thought that was amusing, how it's literally the size of the console itself. Um, you know, it has the touch screen, because it was, uh, I guess they were like, ooh, tablets are popular, let's make a tablet controller, um, with the stylus and such. Um, it actually does feel nice, though, when you hold it in your hands. It's not really... Even though it's bulky, it feels okay in your hands. It's not like a... Really, yeah. <laughs> um, it also has this little spot right here, which is where you would scan the amiibos in. And it's strange, because I remember 
Amiibos didn't launch until about two years after the system, so I wonder if that was the plan from the beginning or something. I don't know, but... Um, yeah, it was... Basically, the point of it was to have, like, two screens. Um, where you could have... Take, for example, Game and Wario is a good example. Where you'd have objects go from the gamepad to the TV screen. Or you would just have two things going on at once. Or sometimes you could use two different screens. Like, say, if somebody was um, watching something on the TV, you could play it like this. Like, a game like Hyrule Warriors, for example. Um, the only real flaw with that is looking at this screen for a while can strain your eyes. <clears throat> um, or if you wanted to play it with two players, Hyrule Warriors, a game like that, you could basically... <laughs> um, you could, like, one person could play on the TV and one person could play on the Wii U. I mean, on the gamepad, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> um, so, finally, we have the newly made Switch. Now, I was pretty skeptical about the system at the beginning because I was like, oh, it's another gimmick, but I think it's a step above because it's, like, this controller is... You know, it's pr a pretty standard controller, like, looks like a dog face, which, <laughs> it does. Like, I remember, I think Adam Korolek was the one who pointed that out to me, which I was like, oh my god, it does look like a dog face. Now it's just like a running joke that everyone says, but, um, it is a nice controller, and the whole, you know, the reason they call it the Switch is because you have different ways of playing the system, which I thought, like, eh, I'm just gonna play a dock, but then I decided, like, oh, this actually isn't too bad, like, switching it back and forth. Um... Now, the Joy-Cons, which are supposed to be, like, their own kind of controller, so to speak, I think they're kind of overpriced. I know a lot of people say the same, which I have to agree, because I know you're getting, like, two controllers in one, but let's be honest, how many people are actually going to play it like this, you know? <laughs> it's like a mini NES controller with a D-pad, basically. Uh, <laughs> and, I mean, I have three nephews, one of which is... Just tur is just turned two a couple months ago, and the other one will be three in July. Um, so maybe in a couple of years, these would be good for them, but I don't know. <laughs> it just seems a little silly and excessive to me. Um, and now the controller is going to turn on because I just plugged them in. Um, but this is a pretty neat controller. It, um, one thing that I find a little strange is that the way you scan amiibos is you actually do it on this analog stick right here, so it, it takes a minute for it to work. Um, that's a little strange, because what if this wears out over time? And this little button right here, you can use to take screenshots, which you can save in your library to look at. But other than that, it's a good controller. Um, because like I said, and it's like, it's not... The thing with this controller is because it's like... Because it... You don't have to play it in the portable mode, or like, the tabletop mode over, you can play just docked, and it's like, oh, there you go, it's a, like, a standard console, and it's not, like, a gimmick that's forced on you, I mean, sure, it's underpowered, some games don't look as pretty because of, you know, they, yeah, but it's still a good system, and, um, you know, the games on there so far, I don't have them on me right now, but it's like, we have ports, um, and then there's, like, some new games, which... I remember Adam Korolek made a good point. He feels like 2018 will be... Like, a good majority of the games for the Switch will be ports, and then by the time of 2019, we'll see a lot of brand new games. But, so far, I'm really enjoying it. Like, I mean, I only have, like, about six physical games, and I think, like, two digital. So, with that, I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying it. I think it's a good system. You know, it's still solid, so... Um... Yeah, I guess that's about it. Um, next week, I'm going to do something a little bit different. It's not really gaming-related. It's more of a nostalgic type of thing. It's actually going to be a response video to another YouTuber. So if you want to watch that, then you can. But if not, that's okay. And until next time, make sure you give this video a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe. And keep on gaming, folks. I'll see you around. Bye-bye.